A man named Kevin suddenly comes to in some alleyway. His face is battered, he doesn't remember how or when he got here, and how long he's been unconscious. Suddenly, he sees a stranger in front of him who introduces himself as Benefactor. The new acquaintance claims he can help him and offers the man a job. Kevin refuses, remembering he needs to go home to his wife. Then Benefactor explains that no accident occurred in this world. Calling the police is futile, and they have met far from the first time, because Kevin has shifted to another reality. Benefactor leads the man to a cafe where it seems everyone knows him. Waitress Tina escorts them to the chosen table, although she cannot hide her fear. After a tense conversation at the table, Kevin realizes that Benefactor is actually Satan. The devil mocks Kevin's faith in God, proposing to discuss his marriage when Tina brings the ordered dish. Benefactor orders her to sit next to them, forces her to eat a piece of food, though she is trembling, and continues the conversation about Kevin's wife, Molly, with whom he had argued in the morning over paying bills. The man doesn't remember this, so Benefactor clarifies that an incident looks different from different sides, because for every choice made by a person, there are countless realities where the choice was different. A choice generates endless possibilities, and therefore realities. And everything a person can imagine in their mind exists somewhere and sometime. Therefore, there is a force that can transfer people between realities, swap people with doppelgangers from another planet Earth, shuffle them. That's precisely what Benefactor does. He has already replaced Kevin's wife, Molly, multiple times. The first time was when Kevin gave her a silly pendant, which Molly's copy threw away. Kevin doesn't believe this nonsense and demands proof. Then Benefactor offers to shift someone. For instance, Tina. Benefactor adjusts some device on his wrist while Tina starts to cry, apparently genuinely frightened. Looking back, Kevin sees her weeping parents and regrets subjecting them to such an ordeal. And when he screams for Benefactor to stop, the girl disappears. The devil explains that she ended up in a world where her parents never met and thus she was never created. So now the poor girl is in a psychiatric clinic. Kevin doesn't understand why Satan needs him, and he admits he's ready to offer the man anything he wants, provided he becomes one of his shifters, people who have sold their souls and transfer others to alternative universes. Other Kevins made their choice, so only he remains. In desperation, Kevin begins to pray silently for God's help. Benefactor furiously screams, claiming he is undoubtedly better than God, and he will never leave Kevin alone. And the more furiously Benefactor curses, the more fervently Kevin prays until suddenly Satan disappears, leaving Kevin in this reality. Horrified at what he has just done, Kevin apologizes to Tina's family and leaves. But stepping outside, he finds the world has changed. Police and strange masks are everywhere and there are bans on virtually everything. Five years later, Kevin is still in this reality, where most of the planet is destroyed by a constant war, after which the shifters came. At first, they operated secretly, moving between alternative universes and expelling everyone who was inconvenient to the totalitarian regime. Billions of people disappeared, but then came Benefactor, who took away people's hope and faith. This is where he wanted to recruit helpers until Kevin arrived. It was after that illegal prayer that he was declared wanted as Kevin, who refused to work for the devil. After that, Benefactor tried seven times to make him accept the offered terms, but Kevin consistently refused, enduring physical torments for it. Kevin bandages his numerous abrasions, listening to the Vika Theater advertisement, where anyone can see their doppelganger from another reality, and pondering rumors that the shifters have left this world. No one knows who the shifters are, as they freely walk between worlds and can take any appearance. Kevin's great desire was to obtain their devices for moving between universes, which they wore on their wrists, because then he would have the opportunity to return to his own world. Meanwhile, he goes to work, where he has only one friend, Gabriel. After work, the man goes to the City Grey slums, where the majority of the population lives. People here have nothing, not even hope. Kevin tries to do what he can and help whomever he can. The Holy Scripture is banned, but Kevin memorizes as much of the Bible as possible and distributes it through his friend Gabriel. And he constantly remembers his wife and the birth of his son. But all happy dreams about them end in a nightmare. One day, Gabriel wonders if it was worth expelling Benefactor like that, if Kevin never received any divine assistance. Maybe there was never a God. Kevin reminds him of the Scripture pages, but he doesn't believe in the possibility of a coming. After such a conversation, Kevin goes to the Vika Theater, whose owner he knows. 
Russo has been unsuccessfully searching for his lost cat for a long time and is not very happy about the man's arrival, but still allows him to participate in the session. People used to simply want to see themselves happy and came here to forget the bad. But now everyone orders a reality for viewing where they are humiliated and beaten even more than in real life on this planet. Russo doesn't control the visions. He just turns on the equipment. This time, he hands Kevin the remote, warning him that his visions are limited by the number of his doppelgangers. And the man starts the session, hoping to see his Molly. He sees himself as a gangster, then a lover, a prisoner, an alcoholic, and suddenly Molly appears on the screen. Kevin jumps up and the session immediately ends. Rousseau doesn't believe he managed to find his wife, but he still sets a new session time. The man leaves and finds himself in a crowd restrained by police. It turns out, after a long absence, Benefactor has arrived in this world, and the police are shooting everyone without trial who causes disturbances. Gabriel pulls his friend from under fire, and the pair hides in an abandoned house. In the evening, Kevin goes to the store and suddenly remembers how their son disappeared when they went shopping and got distracted talking to friends. The child wandered off and vanished without a trace. Their family couldn't withstand this blow. They started to argue, and Molly became addicted to alcohol. That's when he gave her the medallion with the resurrection symbol, but Molly threw it away. The man runs away and meets his neighbor, who invites him over, introducing him to his wife and two daughters. But when Kevin is about to leave, the neighbors suddenly detain him because they recognize Kevin, who refused to sell his soul to the devil. And when he denies it, the girls sing a church hymn for him, bringing Kevin to tears. The neighbors want to know anything about God, and the man recounts to them the parable of Job. Suddenly an alarm sounds, and turning on the TV, people learn about Benefactor's arrival for another recruitment of Kevin. Citizens selected for this mission must arrive at a specified place under threat of death. In the morning, Kevin goes to Russo's Vika Theater again. Russo is frightened by Benefactor's return and lets the man in very reluctantly. Russo is upset, his cat has been missing for four years, and he thinks she will never return, although hope still flickers. Kevin sits in the chair and summons visions, and suddenly he sees Molly again. But in this world, she lives with her mother and a little daughter, and on her chest hangs a pendant with the resurrection symbol. Kevin realizes that this is his real Molly, but Russo doesn't know how to find her, especially since Kevin doesn't have a device for moving between universes. Then the man goes to Gabriel and acquires illegal firearms from him, intending to force Benefactor to return him to his former life in the old reality. The next day he sees Benefactor recruiting another newbie in a cafe, but the street is cordoned off and it's impossible to get closer. Waiting until the police are distracted by a fight, Kevin runs into the cafe, but upon bursting inside, he finds himself in his room. He doesn't understand what happened and goes outside, but immediately armed police confront him and the guy returns to his room. He tries a few more times to get to the cafe, but they open fire on him. In despair, Kevin throws away the gun and turns to God, but instead, Benefactor and Gabriel, who denies knowing Kevin, appear in the room. Satan mocks the foolish man who entrusts his writings to some coward. Kevin is still waiting for the coming, but he is not needed by God, and he will never come to him so he can live well only by coming to Benefactor. Satan also refuses to talk about Kevin's missing son and admits that among all the doppelgangers, only he refused to cooperate. Outside, a scream is heard, and dashing out the door, Kevin sees a police officer shooting his neighbor. Then they open fire on his room. Kevin falls, dropping Gabriel, but the friend is already dead. And then Kevin sees on his hand the device for moving between universes and realizes that he has been one of Benefactor's minions all this time. He removes the device and instantly shifts to another reality, but around him is a desert. Kevin activates the device again and falls into a lake, emerging from which he again realizes that this is not his world. And again, he activates the device. In one of the realities, he ends up in a psychiatric clinic where several shifters with Gabriel's face greet him. He tries to run away from them, but they open fire. Kevin hides, and in one of the rooms, he suddenly sees Tina, who recognizes the man and asks to be returned home to her family. He activates the device for moving again and finds himself in the home of his doppelganger, who accepted Benefactor's offer. Recognizing Kevin, who refused to sell his soul, the doppelganger points a gun at him and tries to take the device but Kevin manages to shift back to his bullet-riddled apartment. Kevin sees his neighbor being taken away by an ambulance as passersby recognize him. 
the man has to run to Russo's Vika Theater. He sits in the chair, finds Molly, and enters the coordinates of her reality into his device. And immediately, he finds himself in a large store where his wife is walking with friends. He cries from happiness at seeing her, but the woman reminds him that the collapse of their marriage was initiated by him. She has found someone else and is happy. Then he sees his pendant and admits that he believes in the possibility of restoring their past relationship. Suddenly, Benefactor returns Kevin to the totalitarian universe in Russo's Vicar Theater, and right there next to him is Tina. Satan shows Kevin Molly crying after their meeting and reminds him that he can still bring her back. But in the corner, a broken Tina is weeping, and only Kevin can decide whom and where to return. Benefactor delivers a speech about God who always lies, promising but fulfilling nothing and allowing such terrible things to be done to people. And suddenly Russo hears the meowing of his cat. She has indeed returned. Kevin laughs at this and remembers all the good that exists in this world. And he decides to give Tina back her life, foregoing personal happiness. Tina's parents embrace their newly found daughter and Benefactor grabs a gun and points it at Kevin. But as soon as Kevin forgoes personal temptations, that is frees himself from the shackles of Satan who eternally tempts people, he is instantly transferred to a reality where Molly is a nurse and a single mother whom he had seen before. He strikes up a conversation, repeating their first meeting, and they fall in love and marry again. He accepts her daughter as his own and later plays with their newborn son. In the epilogue, Kevin says that although this is not his universe, it is now his home, where he has received twice as much as he lost. Inexpensive, but well-written, directed and acted science fiction that turns out to be more of a mystical drama with a religious message. The film is full of allusions to the Bible and direct quotes from the book of Job, and the conclusion is made in the spirit of this parable. But who said that hope is a bad thing?